Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Live View Sports Show. My name is Chris Perry, coming to you live from my home studio here in Westboro, Massachusetts. So glad to have you along with us this evening. We have a really fun show for you planned tonight. Uh, but before we get started, let's uh, take a moment to head down to Live View Studio Control down in New Jersey and say hello to James, our technical director, executive producer extraordinaire. Good evening, James. How's it going, Chris? Yeah, my control room and my living room again. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well, thanks. How was your fourth? My fourth was great. Thank you for asking. I celebrated my birthday on the third, so I uh, had a pretty good weekend. How about yourself? Great, thanks. And uh, happy birthday, James. So glad that you're down there taking care of things in the control room for us tonight. Thank you. So, folks, I got to tell you, if Border Collies and Australian Shepherds had a favorite sport, it would definitely be what we're featuring on our main story tonight, disc golf. So let's get right into it. Coming from beautiful Milwaukee, Wisconsin, John Van Derzen, co-owner of Smashbox TV, joins me right now. And John, good evening. Welcome to the sports show. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm in my basement studio as well. So <laughs> all of us working from home, I suppose. It, it's a it's a truly amazing what we can do with the technology. So, uh, John, I've got a few friends who play disc golf, but I've never actually played myself. Can you tell me a little bit about disc golf as a sport and how you got into it? Sure. Uh, I got into the sport into the sport of disc golf uh, when I think when I was 16. Some friends of mine took me out to a local course up in Appleton, Wisconsin, and uh, I played very poorly. <laughs> and they, you know, they 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 put up with me. You know, just as someone would put up with a new golfer, I suppose. And I probably played every couple months, maybe. And eventually, I, when I got to college, I met another friend of mine who took the sport a lot more seriously than I did. He actually taught me a lot of the real rules and took me to a couple of my first tournaments. And it's played very similar to golf, except with Frisbees, honestly. Specially designed, heavy Frisbees that are a lot more aerodynamic. It's not like your uh, the lids you play with on the beach. These are actually a lot more aerodynamic. There's different designs for different types of shots, just like there are golf clubs, uh, except we don't, and we don't throw into a hole in the ground. We throw into like a, a, a basket contraption, which I'm sure we'll probably see some B-roll of at some point. For sure. So, so John, can you also tell me about Smashbox TV? Because, you know, it's truly amazing what you guys have been able to put together. Yeah. Uh, the same gentleman who I met in college, him and I have remained friends and now business partners for, gosh, 25 years now. And about uh, six years ago, we, we kind of decided that we wanted to make disc golf more accessible to uh, mostly the community, actually. There had been a, a previous outlet who had tried to do something similar, but didn't end up making it. And we kind of looked at it and thought, hey, I think we can, I think we can do this. We can, we can bring disc golf to the wider disc golf community. And so we started up this company called Smashbox TV where we rented uh, our, our very first event was out in California. We, re we rented some live view units uh, and, and went out and filmed. And it was, it was horrible. <laughs> None of us had any experience doing any sort of broadcast or production, and, but we loved it. And so it kind of has grown from there. Over the last five years, we have started uh, a, a weekly podcast for we do it all year long, but it was really originally for more of the off season. So every Tuesday night we go live with our podcast. But, you know, we've gone from being able to just kind of take, you know, the occasional event. Now there's a, a wider tour. We're doing broadcasts of the world championships. There's uh, broadcasts of uh, some other of the uh, disc golf majors that we have. It's it's really kind of uh, it's blown up over the last five years. And I'm excited to be part of the reason why. So how do you produce these events? You, you mentioned you're in your, your basement home studio. How, how do you put it all together? Well, it starts with the live view units, honestly. Uh, th those, are, those are the backbone of our, of our broadcast. Uh, because disc golf is, well, it's a smaller sport, so we don't have a lot of uh, big companies to do a lot of uh, sponsorship yet. Although if you're out there and you'd like to, you know, reach out. And rather than run cable like golf does to an extremely wide course, a lot of our courses are more heavily wooded. So it's a lot harder to drag fiber or cable. So we needed a really good solution to be able to get a signal back to either a production truck or a studio, which is what we ended up doing here. And so we ended up settling on the live view units and the, we take f uh, four live view units right now. We have, I had to remember how many we have in production right now. 
those actually go to obviously our live view server, which I have here in my studio here in Milwaukee. I've got a, a one gigabit up and down connection here at the studio that we pull in all of the feeds from the live view unit and pull them into our mixer, which is a vMix. We use the, uh, the vMix, I think version 23 or 24, whatever the newest one there is. And that's where we do a lot of our production. So from there, I sit behind the, the keyboard and mice and, and stream decks and whatever else we're using to produce it, cutting in graphics and shots, replay, audio. And from there, we bring in a remote studio and push it out to either YouTube or the Disc Golf Network that is a, uh, a brand new uh, pay, uh, paywalled version of uh, our YouTube. So, John, you mentioned you, you bring in commentators here, right? The, how, how do they interface with the system? Because, yep. you know, watching a sport where you're trying to follow lots of different players at the same time does actually take uh, quite a bit of production in order to keep up with. So how do you do all of that? Well, we have kind of settled on using a, a remote booth. Uh, we kind of we've tried a couple different things. We tried booth on site. That didn't work so great. We've tried putting booths in nearby the course. We've done everything from, you know, knocking on doors, talking to churches. At one point, we had a booth in the basement of a church that was a block away from the course. We've done a lot of things, but we have really just now settled on a remote booth in Oregon. And we bring them in via uh, vMix Call, which is a WebRTC to through the vMix software. So uh, I send them a, a multi-view of the cameras so that they can see what's in program and what's in preview. They do the commentating over it. It sends the signal back to me where then I mix it, kind of balance the audio as well as I can. And we produce that. Obviously, like I said, throw the graphics on. I've got a gentleman who helps me do a, a lot of the lower thirds and kind of some of the real basic uh, whole maps and graphics and things like that. And then we push it out to our platform. Uh, actually, I think we push it out to Restream, which pushes it out to a couple different platforms from there. Awesome. So, John, we did actually pull together a graphic of how all of this goes together to just try and make this coalesce for our viewers at home. So let's take a look at that. It all starts with the tournament in Clearwater, Minnesota. The commentators are in Bend, Oregon, and the production center is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Out on the tournament field, there are four LU300 units that are following the various disc golfers across multiple different groups. Those are all sent back to the production control facility inside John's basement in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That consists of an LU2000 server connected to a vMix production system. And they pull the commentators in using a platform called vMix Call. All in all, it's a very simple, easy to use solution that works great. Really a very cool setup that you've got there. Uh, and, and well, it's complicated, it's still, it's still very simple. And so what you, you're, you're really able to up the production value, not with hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment, but with the quality of the graphics and the commentary and the, and the, uh, the, the camera work on the course, right? Yeah, it really is kind of a delicate dance in being able to expand as much as we'd love. We'd love to have 30 cameras on the course, but uh, with the size of our sport, it's just really not realistic. So between the uh, the vMix call, which obviously, like I said, is like a uh, almost like a built-in Skype, I'm on a conference call with all the cameramen directing them during the broadcast, letting them know when they're live and when they're off, where they can go, what you know, who's shooting hot at the moment, so we maybe can roll off a cameraman and go down to maybe just a, two cameras on one card and maybe one on another and one on a third, so we really get a full feel of what's happening on the course. The commentators are doing a great job of kind of keeping track of the entire tournament to let all of our viewers really know maybe some of the stories we haven't we can't get to or that are maybe happened a little bit earlier in the day. It's I swear and I, I no one paid me to say this, but we couldn't do this without the live views. They I can't imagine the cost that it would take us to have to, like I said, run cable through some of our courses because we're we're a very natural sport. We tend to use uh, a lot of what's given to us as far as parks and the preserve that you mentioned is actually on an old golf course that has gone out of business. And the owner of the, the, the land had talked to one of uh, a friend of mine and said, Hey, let's work together to get some people out there. So this year, just last weekend, he had said, this was the most people he's seen on his golf course in two years. And we had to limit the number of people due to, you know, COVID. So it, it's, it's really exciting, but some of our courses are through some really heavy 
and tight wooded shots because part of the sport is being able to uh, make your disc do what you want it to. It's not just who can throw the furthest, but who can be the most accurate as well. So with all the live views, I have no idea how we would do this. <laughs> awesome. We really appreciate it, John. And, and you know, you actually have some former uh, network cameramen that work for you too, right? Yeah, our, uh, <laughs> we've got a few cameramen. I believe it's Catch Cam Sam, as we call him. Uh, he worked for NBC Sports for a while. And uh, this weekend, Trent is, has worked in some college sports in, in Ohio. I can't remember the exact name of the college that he works for, but he's done a lot of sports production for that. So we, we actually have some, some really talented guys behind the cameras these days. And we've worked with you know people who have had a little bit of experience and a lot of experience. Sometimes you don't really get the choice, especially when you're first growing your business. You, you take who's cheap and who's available. And we've really grown, started to grow and uh, expand the sport where people are actually asking us to help now as opposed to us begging for help. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and so, John, you, you mentioned the Disc Golf Network. Can you talk about your, your monetization platform? Because obviously that's an important piece of this uh, to be able to do the types of production that you're doing and keep that production quality so high. Yeah, the Disc Golf Network, it's actually brand new this year. For the last four years, uh, what we've done, the, the Disc Golf Pro Tour, which is the primary tour, uh, one of the primary tours of the sport, has really just relied on YouTube revenue and sponsorship revenue. You know, a lot of manufacturers inside the sport. Well, this year we have moved to a paywall format. So what we do is we charge, I believe it's uh, $5 a month if you're a, a professional disc golf association member. And I think it's $8 if you're not. And, or you can buy, you know, you can rent out or not buy, sorry. Uh, you, you can purchase a event package as well. If you only want to watch for one week. So in, since we rolled this out in late February till just as of like two days ago, we just hit 10,000 subscribers to our network. So it is, it, it's been amazing because now we actually are starting to see some of the resources come back that we can then put back into the, into the broadcast, which is one of the reasons why we're able to do four cameras now and eventually hopefully hire a separate camera op and uh and maybe at some point you know an a1 who can help me with some of the audio issues that we have and it's it's really exciting so the way our the way we work is we have the first two rounds behind a paywall and then we still produce the third round uh for free that anybody can watch on youtube you can you can view that out on the disc golf pro tours web uh youtube page because we're a small enough sport where we still want to grow the sport. We still want to show all the, you know, everybody out there what we are and what we can do. So what people really are paying for is that exclusive live access to the first couple of rounds to see your favorite player play or to check out the, a brand new course like we just saw this past weekend. Awesome. And, and John, lastly, are there any tips that you might give to somebody who's looking to start their own production company or, or kind of get into uh, the, what, what you guys are doing with Smashbox? Wow, that's a tough question. Um, I would say for me personally, I started with something I love to do. I'd been doing disc golf, playing disc golf for 20 plus years before I looked at it and said, you know, this is something I love. I'm sure other people would as well. That's probably where I would start. Find something you're really passionate about and, uh, and start there. Work, see if you can help out. If there's already a production company, maybe everybody can use an additional PA. Everybody needs someone to cut uh, highlights or something like that. See if you can volunteer or help out, but do it in something that you love. It, it, it makes it way, it makes it way easier and much more pleasurable to watch something that you truly enjoy grow and, uh, and really sprout. Awesome. John, thank you so much for joining us tonight on the sports show. Really a pleasure to have you on and uh, best yeah. of luck with the rest of the tournaments. Thank you. Much appreciated. Uh, say hi to everybody out there for me. Awesome. Thanks, John. Real cool stuff right there, folks. I, I'm, you know, I, I'm honestly just, I, I'm going to go play a game of disc golf with my friends now. Uh, so rolling right along tonight, let's get technical and jump into our remotely interesting segment. And joining me now is our very own Vitaly Markovsky, all the way from his home down in New Jersey. Good evening, Vitaly. Good evening. How are you doing, Chris? 
Doing well, thanks. So I know a lot of our users, uh, live view users out there today have heard of NDI. Can you tell us a bit more about NDI and, and how uh, it's used in live view systems? Sure. So NDI stands for Network Device Interface, uh, technology developed by NewTek. Uh, simply stated, it's a manner of streaming live audio and video to a decoder on the local network, similar to the way RTMP is used on the internet. Uh, effectively, using NDI is like connecting an SDI or HDMI cable, except instead of using physical media, you're using your Ethernet network. Awesome. And Vitaly, what are some of the advantages of using NDI over a technology like SDI? So the way NDI works is by using a discovery layer with MDNS, or Bonjour for the Apple fans here, and it broadcasts its availability across the network with no or minimal configuration. So as such, the system will work on a LAN segment even if DNS isn't there. So it's effectively really plug and play. You can just plug it in and other network devices will find it. So if you have an NDI capable device, it'll pick up these broadcast messages and it'll say, oh, look, I have you know, this network device here that I can tune into. Uh, one of the big pluses there is that you can have multiple workstations tune into the same NDI stream. So, for example, you can have uh, one workstation uh, pick it up and export it as SDI. For example, if you're across the network, you know, across the campus uh, where SDI is limited to 100 meters, you know, you can send it to a building over and then export there as SDI. You can have another workstation pick it up and uh, convert it to audio for a podcast, for example. And then you can have a third workstation take it and send it to YouTube or Facebook or something like that to another CDN. So if you were to do something like that with SDI, you would need some type of matrix switcher and something like that, you know, as you know, can get very expensive very quickly. Um, other benefits of NDI is upgrading. As far as upgrading network devices, it, they're generally pretty cheap these days. Uh, if you were to update SDI infrastructure, as you know, especially from professional you know, setups, one of our large corporate customers described uh, updating their SDI plants as requiring a forklift. Um, so, you know, and, and other limitations like the 100 meters for SDI really do uh, limit you as far as if you're a small business or if you're a campus or if you're distributed a little bit. Um, other benefits of NDI include uh, 4K support, so our LU4000 server will support 4K60 across NDI. Uh, additionally, we've deployed NDI in the cloud as well. We do support the NDI discovery server if you have a more robust or more complex NDI implementation. Um, another big plus if you're a live view customer is that NDI uh, doesn't require any kind of licensing. Uh, if you have up one of our servers, you have NDI. And, uh, you know, as we heard with John uh, using vMix, uh, vMix also supports NDI presently as well as the TriCaster, and you're seeing it go into OBS and uh, a lot of other products. So it's definitely becoming a lot more popular. Awesome. So, Vitaly, I know no technology is perfect. What are some of the limitations that you've encountered using NDI as a technology? So. The, one of the potential downsides with NDI is because of the very high bit rate, uh, it doesn't lend itself to streaming across the internet. So uh, there is some compression. For example, if you have uh, you know, someone talking at a podium, the bit rate will go down. You'll see it go down about 40 megabits per second. And then if you have sports or if you have a lot of pix uh, pixel movement on the screen, you'll see it ramp up to about 120 megabits per second. So. Obviously, streaming 120 megabits per second across the internet is, is not a good idea. Um, so because of that, it's not really the best choice for uh, in any kind of streaming for the internet. It's really meant to be streamed on an internal LAN. Um, NDI also may not be the best choice if you're medium size, um, if you don't have your own dedicated network. Now, uh, as far as streaming technologies on the network side, if you use, you know, MPEG Transport Stream or some T2110, those technologies also kind of require their own, you know, net dedicated network segment. So uh, while you can mix and match uh, NDI on your standard workstation network, it's very easy to saturate one of the links. For example, if you have a mixer with seven or eight sources coming in, and if you have a gigabit switch, it's very easy to kind of max out the port, you know, unless you upgrade to a 10 gigabit or 40 gigabit port and, and so on, which requires a little bit of uh, networking knowledge for something like that. Um, lastly, the, the last limitation of NDI is that even though there's been uh, 
a lot of improvements in Wi-Fi. Uh, it's still, that, that's 120 megabits, that's a, a lot of bytes floating through the air. So while, uh, for example, the, the video that I did supported uh, the NDI stream, if you have multiple NDI streams, you're obviously running a little bit of a risk of, uh, you know, dropping some frames or, or dropping some, some packets there. So Vitaly, you hinted at it, but for those who might be looking to upgrade some of their infrastructure to an IP-based transport technology, what other IP-based transports does the LiveView server output? So out of the box, we do support MPEG-TS or transport stream. Um, so this is generally streaming compressed video over multicast networks. Uh, this is frequently used in a lot of uh, cable head ends. Um, it has a pretty high level of complexity from the networking side, and uh, it generally requires a pretty good understanding of digital video. I'm sure you remember, uh, you know, program clock rate and presentation timestamps and all, all sorts of goodies with uh, transport streams from the past. Uh, the LiveView LU2000 supports MPEG-TS out of the box, no licensing. Uh, it's available in the streaming tab, and uh, it, you can actually um, stream that in addition to NDI. So you can actually unicast transport stream to a target while NDI is active, for example. Uh, another one is the evolution of transport stream, which is 70 Uh This is pretty cutting edge technology, very high cost of entry, but uh, it's pretty much an engineering dream. Uh, it gives you total granular control of audio, video, metadata because they each have their own uh, multicast stream. Very tight timing using something called PTP, which is Precision Time Protocol, which is a full order of magnitude more precise than NTP, which is what's conventionally used. Uh, while LiveView doesn't have SMPTE 2110 yet, we are slated to release something hopefully at uh, Q3 this year. So uh, we, we should have something available soon. Awesome. Vitaly, thank you so much for joining us on the sports show tonight. It's so great to see you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Much appreciated. So Vitaly actually spent a couple hours this afternoon and put together a short video of us explaining how to set up NDI within our Live View Central. Let's take a look. So what we're going to do here, uh, I am going to enable NDI on my channel here. So I selected, I'm in the Manage Channels tab inside of LiveView Central. And over here, I'm gonna select the VamLab QA1, one of the channels that it do not have NDI enabled. So what we're gonna do is double click, which will give us all of the various options for the channel. And we're gonna to go to the NDI tab, and all we're gonna do is click Enable. That's all you have to do to enable NDI on your server. So now if you take a look, all of my channels on my server have NDI enabled. So we're gonna go over here to some of our units, I'm going to take a couple units that I have active. I'm going to send this one to VamLab QA1, which is one of the channels with uh, NDI. I'm going to take uh, another one of these at the 610 in here. I'm going to send that to VamLab. Uh, let me see, we'll send that one to the second one. And then I have a third one here. This is just kind of a static camera. It's, it's a little bit dark, but it's okay, we'll just use it as a source just for testing here. So what I'm doing is I'm sending three channels here to my VamLab server, channels one through three. What I'm gonna do is go to file, and just by going to file, you can see the VamLab quad, the source shows up. So what happens with the NDI viewer is that you're gonna get these just um, all the sources that you have available on the network will appear here with the NDI viewer. Likewise, if you have an NDI capable mixer, you'll see the sources just appear. There's, there's minimal configuration involved unless you're on a layer three network uh, or you're using something like a discovery server where permissions are needed. But as far as a basic LAN only local LAN setup, uh, it's pretty much automated. All you have to do is turn on your NDI sources and your player or NDI mixers are capable of finding them on their own. So we're gonna take and select VamLab QA1. So we see this is one of our sources. I'm gonna to go to the second one. This is another source that I have active on my local area here. And then we're gonna to go to VamLab QA3, which is just a camera we have uh, in the office. So I apologize, it's a little bit dark here. You can see the little exit sign and it is working. So just effectively from a uh, setup perspective, that's all we did. We went to manage, we enabled NDI on our channels. We picked our units, we sent to our targets, and then we just picked them up here. That's that's all there is to it. There's uh, you know very little configuration. That is the upside of NDI, and it's uh, effectively plug and play. 
And great stuff right there. We'll definitely be posting that on our YouTube page as well as in our knowledge base so that you can reference that tutorial on NDI later on. That's going to do it for this edition of the Live View Sports Show. Be sure to like and subscribe to our Facebook and YouTube pages so you can stay up to date with all of the latest content that we're producing right here on Live View TV. We'll be back in two weeks when we talk with the Iowa High School Sports Network about how they used Live View Matrix to distribute their sports games to broadcasters in the Midwest. On behalf of everyone here at Live View, thanks for watching tonight. I'm Chris Perry. Thanks for watching the Live View Sports Show.